I've been waiting for the opportune time, and it doesn't appear to be an opportune time, so this is the time that we'll start uh, this particular study in the uh, book of Corinthians, and uh, we'll go through it eventually, but we'll probably take a brief break here as we come to the holiday season, but we want to get launched this morning, and we'll build uh, several themes around uh, this marvelous, marvelous letter of the Apostle Paul to the church at Corinth. I want to begin reading this morning with verse 10 of chapter 1, and I'm reading from the New King James Version of the Holy Scripture. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. What has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I'll say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanas. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. May God's rich blessing be to his red word and may be sanctified in our hearts. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to talk to you this morning from the subject, just for a few moments, from the subject of let's get unified. Let's get unified. I think it was... Fannie Lou Hamer, who once said that if I have my hand open like this, I can't do much damage. But she says, if I ball it up and I make a fist, I can wreak some havoc. And so it's merely the unifying of the five digits on our hand into a fist that can have some power and that can move and that can have energy to make something happen. And so anytime two or three people, and that's what Jesus said, he said, when just two or three come together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. If there's unity just among two or three, if there's a shared vision among just two or three, if two or three embrace an idea or a concept and decide to move it forward, it's amazing what they can accomplish. My brother-in-law often tells this story about his own father, Mr. John Davis, who, like my father, was a retired coal miner. And Mr. Davis told us, tells the story about one day they came out and the foreman came and told them they were going to have to push the train. And he looked at the man like he was crazy. But to his amazement, when all of the miners, some got on the back, some got on the side, everybody got where they could get. And on the count of three, the foreman said, push. And to his amazement, on the count of three, when all of the collective power that was generating from the biceps and the triceps and the leg muscles of those coal miners, they literally were able to move a train. And so it is with the church of the living God. We underestimate the spiritual power that we have when we come together. And when we come together in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, and we decide to collect, collectively get together and put our spiritual energy, put our intellectual acumen, put our abilities behind something, it will amaze us what the, we would be able to move. And so we see tremendous dissension in our country today. And I do not believe that in my lifetime I've witnessed the country being as divided as it is today. Divided around political ideology, around social philosophy, 
you name it, and we are divided. And I believe one of the reasons that it's so easy to divide people and that our division has now become multiplied in a number of times that we are divided is because of the power of the media. Uh, never before in history have we had this type of media with the various venues of media. Uh, like many of you, you know, I carry a cell phone, and literally, there are times I feel like one of Pavlov's dogs. Y'all know anything about the work of Pavlov? He could basically, through conditioned response, he could make dogs salivate because he figured out if I ring a bell, and every time I ring the bell, then I give them the food, that eventually I can make them salivate simply by ringing the bell. And so I can control their behavior because they're conditioned to respond in a certain way. And I find myself, I feel like Wide Earp or Quick Draw McGraw because I'm doing this all day long, all day long. This thing is vibrating because now emails are coming in and texts are coming in and phone calls are coming in. And so it's like vibrating almost continuously all day long. And you find yourself conditioned you know, to, to, to be reaching for it all the time, all the time. The, the, the media overload, all the information that's coming in, and there's so much negative stuff that's coming out. In today's society, you, be, you can become a political star just by criticizing someone. You don't have to articulate any idea that make any kind of sense. You don't have to solve any type of problem. All you got to do is criticize the person that's in office or try to figure out who they were sleeping with sometime or another, sometime where else. I mean, just kind of crazy. And so that just, just, just creates all of this negative energy all around. And so there's one place that we need to be trying to figure out how can we get unified. How can we gather together around a common vision, a common uh, purpose to advance something in the name of the Lord? If there was ever a time that our society needed to hear a clear clarion voice from the church, that time is now because everything is basically up in the air. And everything is just firmly planted in midair and there does not appear to be any traction to move anything in any positive direction. And so that's why we got to talk about as a church, how do we get unified around the purpose of trying to advance the gospel, bringing people to saving faith in Jesus Christ, building them up in, up in the faith, strengthening marriages and families, supporting our children and challenging them to higher excellence in every area of their life. How do we create this distinct community that is so different from the rest of the society that by contrast, it would be inviting it will be winsome and people will be attracted because of the contrast they see of a people unified around vision, purpose, and direction and in contrast to what they see everywhere else. Am I making any sense? Well, I'm not going to be long. I want to set a foundation this morning with this introductory message to the book of 1 Corinthians. Now, the book of 1 Corinthians, it gets its title from the place and the church that Paul was writing to. He was writing to the church at a place called Corinth. And except for a couple of the epistles in the Bible, uh, about three of them, uh, who are addressed to individuals in the New Testament, the rest of the New Testament text is really directed to the church somewhere in a place and to be circulated through the church throughout the church age. And so Corinth, uh, it was an interesting city. And Paul founded the Corinthian church uh, during his second missionary journey. It's recorded in Acts chapter 18. And so Paul comes into Corinth, and he does as his normal pattern is. He goes to the synagogue. That's where Jews are. And he shows the Jews that Jesus is their Messiah, the Christ. Some Jews come to save in faith in Christ. They didn't get kicked out of the synagogue because they say Jesus is the Christ. And then they then go and take the gospel to the Gentiles. So Paul establishes the church there in Corinth. He spent 18 months in Corinth. There was only one other place that Paul spent a longer period of time, and that was Ephesus. He spent three years in Ephesus. He spent 18 years in Corinth. And the reason for the amount of time he spent at Ephesus and Corinth was the nature of the cities that he was trying to penetrate with the gospel. To understand the Bible, we must understand the historical, the cultural, the social, the political, and the economic context. When we understand the context of the Bible, 
from a cultural, historical, political, economic, and social perspective, then we can understand why God can use a Bible that was written a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, how God can take his word written over two thousand years ago, but it still can speak with perennial freshness and with clarion clarity because the situation issues that human mankind face, they're basically the same every generation, every geography, every de demographic. It's just a matter of how much technology do they have or how much technology they don't have, how much resources do they have, how much resource they don't have, but we always are basically the same everywhere in every society. We need food, we need land, we need water, we need some place to live, we need human relationships, we need some place to work, we need some place to grow food. None of these things change. They're always the same. And that's why God's word can always speak in every time, in every place, in every geography, in every culture. And it can speak with a specificity because it is the word of the living God. Now, you gotta, we got to understand just a little bit about Corinth, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it, but we got to understand a, a bit of it, and we'll appreciate what Paul has to say to the church at Corinth. And so Paul wrote to Corinth probably around about 55 AD, during the three-year period where he was at Ephesus. So while he was at Ephesus, he's thinking about the Corinthian church and other churches that he's established and visited. He doesn't have the benefit of Wi-Fi. He doesn't have the Internet, cyberspace. He doesn't have a cell phone. All he has is his secretary, his traveling companion, so he, all he can do is write letters and then send these letters to these churches to see if they'll respond and send a messenger to take the letter to have them to bring back a, an eyewitness report of how are things taking place at that place. And that was Paul's method. So troubled over the city of Corinth and having received a bad report about the church, and having already written them one letter that we call one of the lost epistles and realized that they hadn't gotten any better, Paul now writes them a second letter to see if he can correct some of the chaos and confusion that was taking place at the church. And here is fundamentally what the problem was. If you look at the map, Corinth is in Greece. It's in the southern part of Greece. And it's kind of isolated in the southern part of Greece and during this particular area, area of, of the first century, that it was a part, uh, had been under the Roman, and still was under Roman influence, and so it's, what, it's what's called the Achaia uh, province. And it's 45 miles west of Athens. Now, Athens was the cultural and the intellectual epicenter of the Greek culture, and that's where the philosophers were. And so a lot of this intellectual, philosophical influence that was taking place at Athens it also had drifted down to Corinth. So this was a very, it was, it was a cosmopolitan city. It was a sophisticated city. It was a hotbed of, of intellect and of economic development and growth and so forth. But being in the lower part of Greece, it was connected by what was called the Peloponnesus. And the Peloponnesus was, a, was an isthmus. It was kind of this little narrow piece of land that connected uh, Corinth to the rest of Greece. And so what would happen is it took about a 250 mile journey to go around the Peloponnesus to get to the other side. So what the, the captains who uh, head up the ships would do, they literally would bring their ships on land when they got near Corinth, put them on rollers or skids, and then they would roll them or skid them right near Corinth. So what that did, it turned Corinth into a epicenter of commercialization and enterprise. And you always had people traveling in and through Corinth. So whatever was taking place at Athens, uh, Athens ended up at Corinth. What was happening in Rome? It ended up in Corinth. So it was this cult, metropolitan, cosmopolitan place where all the cultures had blended in to this place at Corinth. And so if something was happening somewhere else in the world, then there was a taste of it taking place in this uh, Greek city of Corinth. So all this traffic came through. On top of that, Corinth was the host to the Isthmian Games. And the Isthmian Games, they were sort of a parallel games to the uh, Olympic Games, our modern day Olympic Games. Both the Olympic Games, it comes from, Greek, from Greece and the Isthmian Games. And so then there were always thousands of people coming to this place, bringing their culture to this place. 
So you can imagine if there was a vice, if there was a sin that was being practiced somewhere, it was being practiced at Corinth. On top of that, like most Greek cities, Corinth had what they called an Acropolis. And the term Acropolis simply means an elevated or a high city. And so they had an Acropolis, A-C-R-O-P-L-I-S, Acropolis. And they had Acropolis, and their Acropolis was elevated 2,000 feet above the city proper. And the Acropolis served a dual purpose. It served the purpose of a military outpost, a strategic military place, and it also was a central place of worship. So here's what the deal was. There was a military presence on the Acropolis because they could see for miles, and they could see out in the Mediterranean, and so they could see if there were any enemy ships that was approaching the Peloponnesus that was trying to come toward Corinth so they could prepare themselves for battle militarily, strategic military outpost, the Acropolis. But also the Acropolis served as the high place for worship. And as many cultures would do, the worship centers, they're put up on the mountaintops. And there on the mountain of the Acropolis, the Corinthians had what was called the Temple of Aphrodite. And Aphrodite was the Greek goddess of love. And Aphrodite philosophy was that the body was to be used for pleasure. And so whatever drive the body had, whatever sexual drive, whatever sexual appetite that was in the body, Aphrodite says that that sexual drive should be fulfilled. As a part of the temple to Aphrodite, there were 1,000 temple prostitutes that lived up on the mountain because the worship of Aphrodite espoused the idea that sexual ecstasy took one in a deeper spiritual realm where they were communing with the gods. And so they had equated sexual immorality and sexual perversion to deep spiritual worship of God. This is Corinth. This could sound like Las Vegas. (laughs) This could sound like Atlantic City. It could be just about any metropolitan place today. There's nothing new under the sun. And at night, the temple prostitutes would leave the mountain, and they would come down off of the mountain and avail their services to all the travelers and all the merchants and all those who were traveling through Corinth. So by the time that Paul writes this letter to this church at Corinth, the city of Corinth throughout the Roman Empire the term Corinth, and they had developed a term called Corinthianizing. When they used the term Corinthianizing, it was the most powerful term that they were using the Roman Empire to describe somebody that was engaged in lewd, immoral, debased, debauched sexual activity. It became synonymous with immorality. And that's what Paul is dealing with. So here comes the 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 challenge for the church. The challenge for the church was this right here, is that there were people who were coming to faith in Jesus Christ after hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ proclaimed that it worked at the temple of Aphrodite. There were women who had been temple prostitutes in the temple house of Aphrodite. There were merchants who had been engaged in the sale of pornea, the Greek term for fornication, from which we get the word pornography, which is nothing new. Uh, the, uh, Corinth was known, well known, for all of its perverted pornographic materials in terms of statues and so forth. There's nothing new under the sun. The only thing different between Corinth and a modern American city is they didn't have a DVD, and they didn't have a VHS, and they didn't have a computer, or a World Wide Web, or cyberspace, so they couldn't record it and digitize it and broadcast it, but they could act it out. And so they had their gentlemen's clubs, their triple X places, which is on the major thoroughfare of the city. And so the people who had been brought up and raised in that type of sexual perversion and sexual morality and indulgence into pharmacia, sorcery, substance abuse, nothing new. Substance abuse ran rapid in Corinth. They had the real stuff. 
and they imported substance from other nations. And they also in, involved as a part of their worship because they felt like that as they had these altered, out of mind experiences, they could enter into deeper worship with the gods. That's nothing new under the sun. It was all happening at Corinth. So now the, the people are coming to Christ. But the culture is so powerful. It, it has such a grip into their lives, into their flesh, into their whole way of viewing the world. They come into the church, but they cannot break the, the, the connection. They cannot break away from the society. So they're bringing the Corinthian culture into the church. And they're trying to figure out how they can justify it biblically and theologically. And so now Paul is writing to try to correct because he understands this is going to cause the church at Corinth to go shipwreck. It's so bad when we get to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 that incest was being practiced in the church and even the pagans didn't practice incest. The pagans abhorred incest, but it was allowed to be practiced in the church at Corinth. And Paul has to deal with that. And so that is the, the occasion. It is this city that's in the midst of this cesspool of sin, all type of wickedness and decadence taking place out in the street, open, protected by the law, kids exposed to it from early ages. It was going on, and it was infiltrating the church, and Paul is trying to write to erect a line of defense around the church. To say you have to be a new community. You have to be the people of God. And so Paul does not give them the, any excuses. I know y'all was born like that, and I know that's the way your family raised you. No, you come to Christ, you repent. You come to Christ, you surrender to the Holy Spirit, and you ask the Lord to help you to deal with those things that have been a part of the, your culture upbringing, those things that have been a part of your lifestyle, but you ask God through the power of the Holy Spirit to help you to overcome. And that's the challenge that Paul is laying out to the church at Corinth. Now, take the time to lay out that foundation because we got to understand that what we're dealing with, it's not uncommon. The ancient cities of old, were they were wicked. They were debased. And as I've shared with you in the past, that you will find one thing that will be common. When people excommunicate the true and the living God, when people eliminate the Bible, from their society or a religious system that holds to a principle of sexual morality, the first thing that will happen is you'll start seeing sexual immorality. Because a part, a part second only to our desire to eat food is our sexual drive. Because sexual activity is the way you procreate. And so God understands if men doesn't have a sexual drive and want to have sexual activity, then they're not going to procreate and the society is going to go extinct. It is a natural drive that God has placed inside of every human species. And well, and not only humans, but every species in the animal kingdom. It's the way they procreate. But if it is not held in check by the principles of the Bible, I am never surprised. I am never surprised when I hear about someone falling into sexual morality. It doesn't surprise me. It doesn't shock me at all. And I don't know why it shocks anybody. Because all of us, if we're not diligent, if we're not careful, we can be drawn away by sexual passion because of the pleasure sensors and the satisfaction that it brings. And something you know that is wrong, your brain will convince you that it's right in the moment of the passion. All y'all Holy Ghost sanctified people ought to say amen. <laughs> because before y'all got Holy Ghost filled and sanctified, you understood the power of your passion and the struggle that you had trying to hold it in the check. And so the Corinthian society like our society today. Our society is sick. Isn't it interesting? In our society, we're trying to justify and protect people's rights to take all the clothes off if they want to. And be in public with all the clothes off. But in the societies that we say that's backwards, in the Islamic society, they say people need to keep the clothes on. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting in our enlightenment? Because we want to press to the 
envelope to the edges our own personal freedom, you see. And that's often driven by the passions and the desires that we have. So we create a whole culture and a whole society around st sexual stimulation. So part of the problem is, I, as a conference the other day, and I was just kind of sitting there listening, and uh, they were talking about domestic violence. And I couldn't be there all day and couldn't stay all day, but I think Sister Melissa was there all day, and she got the DVD, the notes, and the tape. But what I didn't hear anybody talking about is this over-arousal, that young people today are walking around over-aroused. They're over-stimulated all the time because of what they're seeing because of what they're hearing, because of the music that they listen to. And it keeps them on a, 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 the edge of, of sexual arousal. And it's very often the, the arousal that can, can lead to the type of abuse and violence that we're seeing in our society and our culture today. I'm going to take some time at a later date to unpack all of this. Because we got to understand that who we are and what we are at our base, where our appetites are, it is our appetites that drives us to do certain things. Whether it's our physical appetite for food, whether it's our sexual appetite for fulfillment, we can be driven to the fringes and to the edge unless we bring those appetites and desires and drives on the authority of the Word of God and submit them to the Holy Spirit to help us to keep them in check. Where Corinth, there was no boundaries. And that's where our society is headed, where there, there are no boundaries. So the First Amendment right of freedom of speech allows the pornographers to produce the pornography. The First Amendment right to the freedom of speech even allows certain protection for NAMULA, the National Association of Man and Boy Lovers. The First Amendment protects their right to exist it protects their right to propagate and to promote their decadent philosophy. So we are living in Corinth. The United States of America could be called the new Corinth. As a matter of fact, in those uh, communist bloc countries, when the Berlin Wall fell, guess what one of the first things that we imported, exported from us, imported to them? Guess what it was? Pornography. One of the first things we said, that was a whole new market to disseminate. So we are in a Corinthian age, in a Corinthian society. It's no, it's, it's, it's no accident that we have the highest out of teen pregnancy rate in the developed world, in the United States of America. It's no accident we have the highest rate of out of birth, uh, births among teens in the entire world, in the United States of America, because we're a nation that have gone adrift with indulgence and in satisfying our appetites and the unwillingness to say no. Well, that's what they were dealing with at the Corinth, and it was powerful, and it was strong, and Paul knew he had a battle on his hands, and Paul could see that there was more of the Corinthian society in the church than there was the church in the world. And so he's writing to try to address it. So he opens up, and I'm going to just spend a few minutes this morning on this foundation. He opens up basically saying, okay, you Christians, I want y'all to understand that he's talking to Christian people. He said, Call, he said, I'm an apostle Paul. Verse 2, you the church, you're sanctified in Christ Jesus, you called to be saints, all of y'all. Then he goes and says, I thank God not only you're called Christians and saints, but you also are gifted. Verse 5, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift. As immoral as they were, as decadent as they were, as perverse as they were, because God is a God of grace, God had saved them, and God had given them the Holy Spirit, and God had given them spiritual gifts. And because they had spiritual gifts, and they had this spiritual endowment, they erroneously concluded that God is satisfied with how we're living. So if God wasn't satisfied with how we're living, God wouldn't bless us the way he's blessing us. Y'all ought to help me this morning. Y'all making me preach way too hard. Just because 
I am blessed just because I've got food and clothes and shelters and drive a nice car and just because I got good health, that don't mean I'm living right. That just means God is good. That's all that means, that God is good. Because God lets it rain on the just and the unjust, the righteous and the unrighteous. I might be one of the unjust, unrighteous that God is causing the rain and the sun to fall down upon, not because I'm living right. Don't conclude that we're living right just because we're doing well. That's the mistake that they've made. They thought that they were doing, they thought that they really were the spiritual synchronized, that they were actually the standard to which the rest of the churches should have been compared. And Paul says God is just so good and so merciful. God is so kind that you ever booted y'all over into the Mediterranean Sea. It's only the goodness of God that hadn't destroyed you. So he says, I'm not writing you that y'all not saved. No, he said, you're saved. You're sanctified. You got the ghosts. You're not living holy. And then he goes on to say, you also are secure in Christ. Verse 8, who will also confirm you to the end. Just because you live in raggedy, God is not going to kick you out. Because he's already invested the blood, shed blood of Christ to save you. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul is laying a theological foundation, and the rest of his argument is going to be made and based on the theological foundation that he lays down in those first nine verses. If you've been called, if you've been sanctified, if you've been spiritually endowed and spiritually enriched, if you're going to be confirmed until the end, then why don't you live better than what you're living? Why don't you do better than what you are doing? And so there is a remainder appeal is going to be to challenge them to live up to your calling in Christ. Well, five minutes, and I promise you I'll be through. And this is not going to be five preacher minutes. This is going to be five real minutes, Eastern Standard Time minutes. <laughs> you know, as preachers, we'll say, okay, I'm about to close now. And 30 minutes later, we still talk when we're going to close. And one day a little boy said, well, preacher, that sermon sure hit a lot of doors. <laughs> it took you a long time to get them closed. This is five real minutes here. <laughs> then he says, he gets into his argument. I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Paul is saying, don't you realize you're engaged in a spiritual war? And don't you understand that the enemy is trying to destroy you with immorality and with vulgar living and with all of the crazy stuff that's going on around you? And the only way you're going to be to stand up against it is y'all got to form a fist together. And y'all got to come together and pray for each other and guard each other's back spiritually and agonize before God and help each other grow. He said, you're divided and you're going to be conquered and destroyed by the encroachment of evil that's all around you. So he says there's a crisis here, a crisis of chaos and division. For it's been declared to me, and I like Paul, I like Paul. And one of the reasons I love James Ely, James Ely is one of the most honest people I know. Now, if you don't want something repeated, don't tell Ely. Because if you tell him, he's going to say it. We up in Manhattan, New York, I mean with the, some of the biggest shots in the country, the Secretary of Education, Arnie Duncan, uh, Melanie Barnes, the, the President's Chief Domestic Policy Officer, Randy Druckermiller, one of the wealthiest hedge fund people in the entire world, Jeffrey Cannon over the Harlem Children with the great big conference. And so we were now together, and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Blackwell from the Policy Institute, one of the most eloquent intellectual women in this country, run this incredible organization in California. And so they got this great program. And I say to Eli, I said, Eli, they didn't start in prayer, and, and they didn't pray over the food, and I ain't heard prayer mentioned yet. And so we're walking down the hallway, and we pass Dr. Angela Blackwell. Eli said, uh, uh, Dr. Blackwell, Robert Watts said. <laughs> Y'all didn't start in prayer. <laughs> Y'all didn't pray on the food. He said, I, I'm just saying what he said. 
And after I thought about it, he said, I, he, he's right. But he the one that said it. I didn't bring it up. <laughs> That's what Eli will do you. Know? I'm just telling you that. And so Paul says, it's been reported unto me by somebody. No, Paul said exactly who said it. So Paul says, Chloe's household told me that y'all were fighting and arguing and cursing each other out, undermining each other's reputation, taking each other's husband, trying to take each other's wife. Y'all all doing this in the name of the Lord. But y'all think I'm exaggerating. Wait till we get to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm not exaggerating. That's exactly what they were doing. So Paul says now, and then somebody said that they are of Paul. And they are of Apollos. And somebody said, I'm of Cephas. And then the real spiritual people say, well, Paul can't tell me nothing. Paul can't tell me nothing. Apollos can't tell me nothing. It's just me and my Bible. I'm of Christ. The only problem is they ain't have no Bible because the New Testament wasn't put together yet. So they had to listen to Paul, and they had to listen to Cephas, and they had to listen to Apostle. But because in their intellectual arrogance, they didn't think nobody could tell them anything. We live in Corinth. And then Paul said, is, is Christ divided? Was, was, was Paul crucified for you? Not only that, Paul said, I'm not claiming none of y'all. You weren't baptized in my name, were you? Paul said, matter of fact, I didn't baptize none of y'all rascals. Wait a minute, except Crispus and Gaius and maybe Stephanus, because I don't want none of y'all saying that y'all were baptized in my name. He said, what is wrong with you guys? Don't you understand that God in Christ has reconciled you from the filth, from the debauched lifestyle, from the sexual morality, from the gluttony, from the crime of the Corinthian society to bring y'all into a new community together? Don't you understand that the same blood that was shed for your sins was shed for the sins of the person who sits next to you in the church? Don't you understand that in Christ, y'all are equal in your stature and standing before God, and that God has now knit you guys together, and together you are to collect and lift up a testimony to the rest of the decadent society. So Paul is appealing to them to become unified. You know, someone tells a story that had you been around, the only thing that was worse than what was happening inside the ark. You know, when God told Noah and the animals to come into the ark, and they was in that thing for over a year and plus. Can you imagine what the odor was like in the ark? Can you just imagine what the odor was like inside of that ark during that period of time? But somebody said that the only thing that made the odor in the ark bearable was a storm on the outside. I just thought about to tell y'all this morning, those of you who think about quitting Grace Bible Church, leaving Grace Bible Church, or just leaving the church altogether, I tell you what, I don't care how bad the older get in here, you get out there in the world with them people out there in the world, out there in an evil, wicked system where people are just driven by greed and by pride and by arrogance and by lust for power, and people will cut the grandmama's throat for a dollar. You better stay close to somebody's church somewhere. Just stay as close to somebody's church as you can. And so Paul is saying, don't you realize that Christ is not divided and anything that you do to hurt a brother or a sister, you're doing it to yourself. It weakens you. If I hurt you, I weaken me. If I hurt you, I'll weaken me because I need your prayers, your support, your encouragement. I need for you to be standing strong at your post because God blesses the church and God is infusing his life and his power through the members of the church. So every member of the church has to be as strong as we can make them because we all are drawing life from that common body. And then Paul says this, and my five minutes is up. For real, I'm looking at the clock. <laughs> For Christ did not send me to baptize. Now, he's not demeaning or belittling baptism. It's important. But Paul says, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. 
because it's the gospel who has the power of God unto salvation in everyone that believes. It's the gospel that calls people out of darkness and out of sin and out of decadence and out of perversion and causes them to repent and turn toward God and fall down broken before him. It's the gospel. And Paul is saying God has given the church the gospel. The church is entrusted with the gospel. And so the church has the only hope, the only antidote, the only medicine that can deal with the decadence in the society. But to do it effectively, we got to be unified. It doesn't mean that we're not, we're not going to always agree. We're going to disagree sometime. We're going we're gonna to argue sometime. We're going to fuss sometime. But we got to be determined we're going to just kind of stay together. Just stay together. Y'all know my Al Green, man, don't you? One of these Sundays I'm going to break out with let's stay together. <laughs> oh, I, that's one I can croon. There's two songs I can croon. Let's stay together. And I'm still in love with you. I, I can work with them too. I can work with them too. And I think those two are fitting for the church. We'll just stay together. Because we're still in love with each other. And we know who we are. Amen? Amen. My five minutes are up. I thank you for my time. Let's bow for prayer, shall we?